Thanks so much, Brad, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, The Next Frontiers for Providing High-Value Care in Hospitals, brought to you by the AHA's Physician Alliance. To present today's session, I'm really pleased to have with us Dr. Chris Moriades, Assistant Dean for Healthcare Value and Associate Professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he speaks internationally on topics related to educating clinicians about healthcare value and how to implement high-value care programs, and he's also a great teacher and a good friend. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to get us started. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That, that was a perfectly succinct and nice uh, intro. Um, so thank you to everybody for spending this time with us uh, today. As mentioned, I plan to talk about the next frontier. So we're going to very quickly lay the background of sort of what's gone on from my perspective in high value care um, over the last five to ten years, but move quickly from that into where do we think we're heading. Uh, and we'll have time at the end definitely for some discussion and, and questions and answers. So I wanted to start with a quote from my old boss, um, Bob Wachter, who some of you may be aware and um, helped coin the word hospitalist. And Bob talked about, uh, he actually wrote this in the intro to our book called Understanding Value-Based Healthcare. He said, today's clinicians and administrators may be unsettled, even overwhelmed by all the pressures they now find themselves under to deliver high-value care. More stringent regulations and accreditation requirements, public reporting of various value-related measures, value-based purchasing initiatives, new payment models such as bundling and accountable care organizations, even Yelp reviews and apps that offer cost and quality data with a single click. It's certainly a lot to take in. Yet what is odd, even bizarre, is not that we're now under such pressure. What is odd is that until recently, we were not. And I think that's a nice way for us to start to ground our conversation today. And Bob wrote this in 2015, and we've seen tremendous progress. The framework that I have been thinking about, the way that the high value care movement has been moving, and we'll break this down, has been that it really in some ways started around transparency and raising awareness. We have moved into a focus really on appropriateness, and we'll talk about what that's looked like and what that means. And I'm going to argue that we're now starting to move into the third overlapping phase, which will be an increasing focus on affordability for patients. And so as we look at that first stage of high value care, transparency and awareness, this was actually probably about a decade ago where we started to see things like cost awareness curricula. That's um, how I pretty much kicked off my career as a resident was uh, starting this curricula for my colleagues at UCSF, just starting to raise awareness about cost. Um, then you also around that same time started to see this new phase of studies around providing costs in EHRs and what is the effect of that, what happens if we give ordering providers these costs, uh, and I think we've seen some mixed results of that. And at the same time, in both the public and the medical literature, we started to see an increasing focus in recognize, recognizing harms of overuse in healthcare costs. So phrases like financial harm, financial toxicity, um, the less is more series launched in JAM Internal Medicine. Uh, there were, um, and there continues to be, a number of articles. Um, we saw uh, Libby Rosenthal's series, Paying Till It Hurts, in the New York Times, where you've got front page above the fold stories about $500 um, sutures and whatnot. And so I, I think that this was really the first phase to start to raise awareness. And as I talk about each of these phases, I, I drew it this way on purpose to show that none of them are done, right? We, we certainly cannot say mission accomplished, transparency, and awareness, or, you know, these aren't uh, discrete episodes, but rather um, things that have started and then moved and built upon. And I'm sure, you know, I know I'm speaking to a whole bunch of folks, hospital administrators, uh, physicians, um, healthcare professionals, and so this is not news to you, but I wanted to quickly tell you my quick story of, um, that highlights the lack of transparency and understanding of costs in healthcare. So when I was a resident, as I mentioned, at UCSF, I was incredibly, became interested in this question. And I, I'm not a business guy, not a dollars and cents guy. Uh, but I just thought this was really fascinating that nobody could tell me how much anything costs. And so I used my position as a trainee to, to ask the head of the lab, hey, I order tests here, you know, every day. It seems like hundreds of lab tests, and yet I've never really gone down and seen what the lab's about. Could you teach me about it? Could I come down? And I 
I came down into the to the lab and he walked me around and he showed me all the machines and showed me what happens and how they run a blood test and I started to talk to him about it and I said, you know, could you help me understand because I know that we charge $105 for a CBC. That's the, the price, the charge that the, it's put on the charge master. Um, but how much does it really cost to run that blood? And essentially he started to tell me about, well, it's really complicated. You know, the machines are expensive and over time, and you know, it, it depends on how many blood tests we run that day and how many people are working in the lab. The reagents are really cheap. But, and so he gave me this whole story about why it was really damn near impossible to know how much it costs. And I walked out saying, okay, that makes sense. I get it. We don't really know how much it costs. But like I say, I walked down the street and I, got, I went to Starbucks and got a cup of coffee. And it sort of hit me that I am pretty sure Starbucks could tell me exactly how much that cup of coffee costs them to make every day. And it's similarly complicated and depends on where the beans came from that day and how many people bought coffee and so on and so forth. And we just really haven't forced ourselves to know how much things cost, uh, both at this micro level and at the macro level. And even those within healthcare didn't, don't have transparency. And this, um, really struck me because actually just last month I was in Las Vegas with my colleague Neil Shaw from Costa Care and we were giving a big talk at the HFMA, the Healthcare Financing Management, Healthcare Financial Management Association. Um, at their annual conference, we're in a room, probably almost 500 folks. These are all CFOs, financial administrator, I mean high level people from um, mostly hospital systems. and. We t I told the story and asked them, how many could tell me exactly how much it costs to run a blood test in your health system? And I have to say, I asked this question to be provocative. I expected that not everybody would raise their hands. There were about three hands in this entire audience that went up, and that really took me, took me aback, um, that we continue to not be able to, even the, the financial people in the hospital can't seem to know how much it costs to run a blood test. And you may be on the other end of this line asking yourself whether that is the most important question and does it really matter how much it costs to run a single CBC or do we need to understand more about how do we tell patients how much it's going to wrong there but uh, but you heard me throughout you, you hear yeah. so maybe some of the folks still hear me we might have just lost a few lines or something it seems like oh now it seems at least one person has said we're back Our okay audio is back. okay it's back all right so I'm not sure where you all dropped out but uh, welcome back um, so I was talking about how we had published in 2012 this article in JAMA about first student financial harm, recognizing the fact that now simple decisions physicians make about testing could directly lead to thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs, um, and that we needed to start to address this. Although, frankly, we didn't have a lot of ways that we could do that, um, but it was something, once again, we're in the raising awareness and transparency stage. I would say that we fairly quickly, as a as a movement, as a group, um, as a profession, moved into the appropriateness stage um, and started to say, well, there's all this waste out there. Why don't we start cutting out waste and getting rid of low-value care? And this is where, as we'll talk about, you saw the Choosing Wisely campaign launch, um, lots of frontline clinician-led projects. You see appropriateness criteria and guidelines from uh, the American College of Cardiology, American College of Radiology, although they had actually been doing it uh, much longer than this. 
And as I'll go over in education, I believe we've really seen a noticeable shift in this idea of thoroughness being our professional identity that we strive for to appropriateness. And if thoroughness is good, I would argue that appropriateness is, is better. So breaking that down quickly, choosing wisely, I'm sure many of you are familiar. Uh, turn five years old, it's actually now six years old. Um, it's an initiative of the ABIM Foundation where they have asked professional societies to come up with lists of five things within their own uh, purview that, quote, patients and physicians should question. And so this is a picture of my son, Julian, who was also five at the time. Um, at this event uh, for Choosing Wisely's five years. And I would say there's been a tremendous amount of progress over these five years. You know, Choosing Wisely, by the way, is now an international campaign. They've signed up more than 80 specialty societies. It's in, I believe, about 20 countries now um, and has really been a successful campaign in spreading the word. And also, as we've seen over the last five or six years, um, hospitals and hospitalists and, you know, physicians who work in hospitals have led the way in taking up this torch and taking those ideals and turning them into actual frontline clinician-led projects. Um, this uh, photo I took at the High Value Practice Academic Alliance, which is out of, um, led out of Hopkins by Pam Johnson and, and others, and they've, they've signed up, I, I think it's close to 100 uh, academic medical centers across the country who've participated. And when I went there, there were just poster upon poster of these initiatives. They've also taken to more recently publishing um, guidelines for different topics within JAMA Internal Medicine. And when we go to our national meetings, like the Society of Hospital Medicine um, meeting, oh, now I've lost my slides. Oh, here, they, here they come back. The Society of Hospital Medicine meeting um, that I was at in 2017 in Vegas, um, once again, just had lines and lines of posters of hospitalist-led work uh, around high-value care interventions, and folks who um, have, been, uh, have been leading the way in decreasing waste, cutting out low-value care for syncope and pulmonary embolism and transfusions and, and sort of all these areas. But on, on top of that, I should say, we um, have seen the shift, as I mentioned, within medical education. We compiled the shift for the five-year Choosing Wisely anniversary. It was published in the Health Affair blog, um, looking at the transformation of medical education. And so we talked about moving from an ethos of thoroughness to appropriateness. And I think if we quickly review what's happened there, we first set out to define competencies for Choosing Wisely, and UCSF, uh, Center for Healthcare Value, came up with very discrete competencies. And from that, uh, we saw teaching resources proliferate. Um, so we led a wisdom of the crowd, a crowdsourcing campaign where we collected ideas from across the country of folks that have been implementing educational initiatives. The American College of Physicians has released their high-value care curriculum, which has been picked up by internal medicine residencies across the country. We, at the time, published a, a book um, called Understanding Value-Based Healthcare, um, and then also launched a series in JAMA Internal Medicine called Teachable Moments. And I have spent a lot of my time, and one of the reasons I came here to Austin is I had the opportunity to build a, upon all that work and build a resource for all. And so we've created these um, learning modules uh, that are really interactive based on um, active learning and engagement uh, theories uh, at value-based healthcare or vbhc.delmed.utex.edu. And these Discovering Value-Based Healthcare modules are available for free. They offer free CME credit, and they're really meant for anybody within healthcare to understand what are the concepts of value-based healthcare that we should know on the front lines. Um, so we use these with medical students, with residents, and practicing physicians, um, as well as PAs and nurse practitioners and nurses. And so hopefully it would be a, a helpful resource um, for you and your groups to go on and see. We, we actually are releasing this week the third collection, which will talk about high-value prescribing and high-value communication. And the last collection that we'll produce before the end of the year goes over how to improve value within systems um, and how do you design projects and uh, systems change. So that was quickly how we got through um, the transparency and the appropriateness movements. And if this will advance.
So uh, I can't see my slide. What, what it should advance to is that we're now going to talk about the next phase, um, which really is about starting to think about care redesign and affordability. And there's a number of different areas that I wanted that I want to break down for care redesign and affordability. Am, am I the only one who's not seeing the slides, or are all you guys having the same problem now? We're seeing them. Uh, it's now on uh, one of good work with Julian. Um, oh, okay. That's interesting. I don't see it at all. Okay, so the point I want to make about Julian, thank you, is that uh, Julian was five years old at the same time choosing wisely was five. And the reason I want to make this is because as I took that picture, it made me realize something I think fairly profound, which is that, you know, five years, all this from nothing, incredible progress, um, and yet at the same time, incredibly immature, right? We've got a long ways to go. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, that this is going to take time, and that, yes, we've seen all this progress, and we will continue to see a lot of progress, but that really um, we have a ways to go. And that's where I wanted to take us. So I wanted to quickly do that drive-by of all these different topics um, of sort of where we've been, um, but I wanted to, to focus our conversation on where we are going. So um, I'm not sure how to proceed without being able to see my own slides, and I'm not sure what's wrong with that. Um, Maybe someone, I don't know, Lisa, can you advance them for me? <laughs> yeah, we're um, now on the New York Times uh, health issue, trying to put a value right. on doctor and patient relationship. Cool. So why don't we do that, and I'll just, maybe you can advance, and I'll tell you uh, when to advance. So, you know, as we think about how we're going to now address care redesign and affordability, um, one of the redesigned uh, topics, or one good example of this is, if you saw recently in the New York Times Magazine, Sunday Magazine, um, this fantastic article that featured the work of David Meltzer and others around thinking about comprehensiveness, or comprehensiveness, or um, what some have called extensivist. Essentially, determining those highest risk patients who we all see in the hospital, who we discharge, who really need somebody who's going to quarterback their care and, and provide continuity of care both in the hospital, in nursing facilities, in clinic, and so on. Um, and so uh, this, this model, I think, is just one example of how we need to start thinking about redesigning care once again in ways that will provide better value for our patients. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I've laid out here in, in sort of no real particular order but very concretely, what I've been seeing on the ground as kind of the next frontiers where people are starting to push this forward and where I think we can start to focus on how can we push forward um, each of these topics, measure and improving outcomes that matter to patients, taking on the hard questions, so moving beyond just obvious waste and low-value care, uh, creating administrative homes and hospitals for overuse, creating a high-value culture in hospitals, and addressing affordability. So um, moving on to measuring and improving outcomes that matter to patients, if you look at the equation for value, there's many different equations that get thrown around for this. Um, but the one that we have settled on at Dell Medical School is outcomes that matter to patients over total cost of care, which really gets back to the original Heisberg, uh porter definition of value, um, which uh, which, you know, talks about we really want to improve outcomes, outputs, not just inputs, like things that we can't measure so well, like quality. We want to understand outcomes. And I have to say, when I teach this to residents and medical students, sometimes they get caught up on why we add that second part, measuring what matters. So um, if we go to the next slide, measuring what matters. Yep. Once again, I can't see where we're at, so I'm just trusting that we're moving along here. <laughs> we're on that um, And And uh, – and if we move along here, we can talk about, so it is important that we don't just think about outcomes. There are outcomes that don't matter to patients. The example that I can point to that's perhaps easiest is length of stay. I don't know about you guys, but obviously our hospital, like I'm betting yours is, is extremely focused on length of stay. In fact, I was voluntold that I was in charge of our length of stay committee at our hospital. Um, and so, you know, and this is an important metric. Don't get me wrong. Length of stay is something I totally believe we should pay attention to. We need to come up with interventions for. Um, all of this is, uh, is true. However, what has happened 
by focusing on length of stay. So if you look at this article from the New England Journal, you look at the left-hand side, uh, you will see that as length of stay has decreased in hospitals over time, um, length of stay in post-acute care facilities has actually increased. And in fact, the total length of stay for patients has gone up. And so what we've done essentially is we've started to shift patients out. We've started to shift them to post-acute care facilities um, and to, uh, to nursing, you know, nursing homes, LTACs. And what I would argue is that while length of stay does matter to patients, what really matters to them is home-to-home -home time. Uh, and that home-to-home -home time, is, you know, that, that's what they care about. If, if you just move me out of the hospital but put me in a nursing home that looks all the world to me like a hospital, that's not an outcome that matters to me, even if that's the outcome that you're following at your hospital. And the reason this is important is because home-to-home -home time becomes much more of an aspirational goal. When we focus on something like that, it causes us to change and to restructure the system. Because if I'm held accountable for home-to-home -home time, that means I need to work with the nursing facilities, with the LTAC, to ensure that we're only transferring patients there when it really is the right answer, and that they are providing high-quality care, and that they're discharging patients uh, in a timely manner and in a safe manner. Um, and so it compels health systems to work, to take a broader view of their work, and to do it in a way that is less fragmented and more patient-centered. So moving along, this is great. I, my slides are back, by the way, so thank you. Okay. Um, the next topic is to, as I put, taking on the hard questions. So as we talked about appropriateness, we really started to focus on moving or, you know, cutting out waste. And I was a bit naive in this. I, I was asked early on, it was like, well, what are you going to do when you run out of low-hanging fruit? And I was like, look, we're not going to get there for a long time. <laughs> there is so much low-hanging fruit. We, we've got so many things uh, that we can do in medicine. But I have to say that it, it became pretty um, – pretty quick here that we've noticed that uh, there, there is a limited number of things that we do that are truly no value or truly low value in ways that we can say, look, we need to cut that out. Most of what we do in medicine, of course, are, are gray areas. Um, and most of what we do in medicine is helpful for some people in some circumstances. Um, and so, like I said, this is not to say victory, we've cut out all waste, we haven't come close. But we have identified many of the things, and I think to really improve value, we need to get beyond that and start asking some of the harder questions. Um, I, and in order to do that, we need to understand costs in healthcare. So we can't even start to address those unless we have the discipline to sit down and say, how much do each of these things actually cost? And then we can start to answer, is it worth it? And this is not impossible. So um, under the incredible leadership of Vivian Lee, who has since uh, left University of Utah and is, is now, um, I just saw at, uh, at Google, I believe. Um, but under Vivian Lee's leadership, University of Utah has been able to create a cost master um, where they really spent the, the resources and the time and the discipline required to sit down and say, how much does each thing in the hospital cost? Um, and in order, and by doing that, I think we all should take that example and say, yes, this is necessary to start asking the tough questions about when is it worth it. And I actually just this morning um, was, I, on Tuesdays, I oftentimes meet with this um, health service researcher, Joel Savat, who's got a joint appointment in San Antonio and here at Del Med, and he's up here in Austin on Tuesdays. And um, we've really been hashing through how does CEA, cost-effectiveness analysis and value-based healthcare, where do they come together? And how can we use the discipline of CEA to start to answer some of those more challenging questions about not only how much does it cost, but is it worth it, uh, which I think is really important. Now, the next section I want to talk about is an administrative home. So the other thing that has started to take focus at, at hospitals is that we need to have a place to house this, um, this work. And this really came about, uh, once again, another JAMA article um, that I had written with a, um, with a trainee, uh, Josue Zapata, where we had at, at um, UCSF the Patient Safety Committee 
actually got an unsolicited um, request one day from a primary care provider. And so oftentimes we would get um, requests to review cases because some sort of adverse event had occurred, some sort of patient safety issue, something that they had seen. Um, and in this case, this primary care provider emailed and said they, that she wanted this case reviewed because she was just uh, um, in awe, I guess, at the amount of resource utilization um, that was used on, the, on her patient. Um, that she thought was excessive and had uh, potential to cause harm um, to our patient. And so it was an interesting question, does this belong in the Patient Safety Committee? And we argued, and we argue in this paper, that it really does, that it needs to be reviewed, that overuse is a often overlooked but important source of patient harm and a quality issue. Um, my slides are gone again, uh, but hopefully we're on the next slide, which shows the editorial at the time talked about creating an infrastructure for this um, within hospitals. And where does that live? And should it live within the patient safety infrastructure? Um, and, uh, and, and basically argued that we need to sit down and say, what is the administrative home to address this? Um, and I, I suspect that at each of our health systems, it's probably a little different. It may be within your patient safety infrastructure, maybe within your quality infrastructure, or perhaps increasingly there are um, value groups, people who are specifically focused on cutting out overuse, um, decreasing unnecessary services, improving outcomes, um, and perhaps that's where it lives. But I think the point being that we need to really start asking ourselves and, and each other, where does this actually live to give it teeth and to give it a home um, and for it to, to really take root? Um, at UCSF, we really solved this first by creating a committee that was the High Value Care Committee within the Division of Hospital Medicine, where we focused on our own practices and tried to find areas um, that we should target. And eventually, we started to realize that it overlaps so much with our quality improvement work and our safety work that the quality improvement and safety and value groups um, ended up merging, essentially, and becoming a value improvement committee, uh, with the value improvement committee really addressing quality, safety, overuse as all components of healthcare value. So moving on um, to the next slide here, uh, the, other, the other area um, that I wanted to talk about is creating a high value care culture within our hospitals. Um, and so we know that what drives a lot of overuse is not lack of knowledge that physicians um, and folks, oftentimes, they know what they're supposed to do. They can answer the right question on the test. Um, but what they, what they lack is a culture around them that supports this. Uh, and so we sought to try to determine what, what creates that culture. We tried to take a, a page out of the patient safety playbook once again. So we know in the patient safety movement that more than a decade ago, uh, they the researchers and ARC um, kind of simultaneously were able to determine uh, different areas um, that created a patient safety culture. And they, were, they determined those uh, different topics and um, factors, and they created a patient safety culture tool, a survey, which many of you are familiar with because we use it all the time. And over the last decade, that patient safety culture tool has been associated with certain outcomes. So they've shown that as patient safety culture improves, um, adverse medical uh, events decrease. Um, so medication errors decrease. Um, as patient safety culture improves, uh, fetal maternal mortality on a delivery, uh, labor delivery floor um, decreases. And so, uh, so we sought to use that same concept. And we created um, through a national modified Delphi process a high value care culture survey that we then tested amongst internal medicine residents and hospitalists, um, first in two hospitals in California, and we've now since tested it in I believe it was 18 hospitals um, with, uh, with a paper that's under review um, showing that it essentially works. And in this, we, we determined that there were four major domains that seemed to shake out as to creating a high value care culture. The first, and by far it seemed the most important, was leadership and health system messaging. 
this, this really showed that it wasn't about necessarily what the mission statement is or what's hanging on the wall next to the uh, elevator that says we're focused on this. This was about what is your leadership and health system actually message to you as the frontline provider, as the resident or the hospitalist. Um, so in other words, as I oftentimes say, you know, if your hospital says we're all about value-based health care and putting the patient first, but the only email you get as a hospitalist from your CMO has to do with your billing all the time um, and whether or not your, your CMI is at the right level, uh, that's your messaging, not what's on the wall. Um, and so that seems to be critically important, as I think we all would sort of understand. The second um, component, data access and transparency, this is both around quality and some idea of cost. So having some data transparency and access internally um, to use that showed uh, how folks are doing or how groups are doing around quality and cost seemed to be important. Third component was having comfort with cost conversations, discussing with each other and discussing with patients about costs and, um, and trade-offs. And then the last component was a blame-free environment. Once again, this idea that, um, you know, if you, if you order a CT scan that causes renal failure, nobody seems to blame you. But the moment you don't order a CT scan and you miss something, the one out of a, out of a thousand, um, people are really worried that they will be blamed. And so creating an, a just culture, just like in patient safety, a culture that doesn't let people off the hook, you, you remain accountable, but really says, um, you know, we're not going to place a new blame on people um, and we're going to uh, understand and take things in context. So um, the next slide is, uh, is the last topic here. So I think all of these areas are things that people have started to push on. These are the frontiers that hospitals are starting to look at. And the last one I believe is going to be one of the hardest for us to crack, and that's addressing affordability. And the point I want to make here is um, this slide I took from my colleague Neil Shaw, once again, um, is that as we've seen over time, uh, the whole country um, has uh, healthcare costs have been increasing. And this is what oftentimes gets the headlines, you know, GDP, and we hear about, oh, we're at 18% of the GDP, we could be at 20 by 2020, um, and we hear about numbers in the trillion, trillions, and indeed, the total healthcare costs, total cost of care, have been increasing steadily over time. But the other part of the story here is household costs. Um, so the percent of total household costs that go towards health care has been increasing at a rate that's even faster than our total health care costs on a national level. Um, this is to say that affordability for patients is becoming an even bigger problem and more pressing and is disconnected from, the, uh, from total health care costs. And this is what we've been seeing on the front page of newspapers um, and what we've been hearing about. And the thing to recognize about that and about affordability is that we need different solutions. Because another way to think about value that we've outlined at Cost of Care is if you think about from the patient perspective, what is it that they want to say that their health care was valuable? Is they want to say that they can afford it, that it's safe, and that it was personalized or personally meaningful to them. And one thing we've recognized is that each of these areas um, have different workflows. They're disconnected. So we need to think about how to address each of these workflows. Um, and they're not going to be, there's not one intervention. And so as we've focused on improving safety and focused on cutting out overuse, we have really focused on the clinical workflow. There's a lot of work that happens around focusing on the experience of care and making things personable and meaningful. Um, but I would say that in hospitals, we haven't focused as much on this financial workflow and where we intervene. And the, the stark reality is I think we have to face the fact that cutting out waste is important and we need to do it, but it is not going to trickle down to patients. In other words, it might improve safety, it will on the aggregate, hopefully improve total cost of care. It should if we're able to truly cut waste out of the system, but it is unlikely to make a meaningful impact on actual affordability for patients. And so what do we do when the care a patient needs is both necessary and expensive? So not waste, but necessary and expensive. And we know this is the case because we can see um, that in a number of, uh, there's been a number of articles recently that have shown 
that even folks who are insured, when they go to the hospital, they, uh, there's an increased rate of bankruptcy following that. There's serious economic consequences of hospital admission. And that's not our fault. It's necessary and expensive. But the question is, this is our challenge. What can we do about it? Because I think that is going to be the key to our success, is whether we can actually address this affordability. Um, and if we, if we think about how, what we're going to do about it, I think we need to recognize, as Dr. Don Berwick has said, better performance is not simply, it's not even mainly a matter of effort. It's a matter of design. We need to think about how we're going to design this care differently. So going to my slide here with the 4x4, four four, uh, which also comes from work that I've done with Neil, uh, we've started to think about this as there's not going to be one size fits all. If you start to think about patients in different segments, there are patients who both have high or low exposure. Um, so based on whether they're at risk for having uh, expensive health care um, for all different reasons or at risk for not, um, you know, they're, they're on a high deductible plan or they're uninsured, um, and so they, they have high exposure. And then we also have patients who have high and low engagement. And I would say that there are folks where that are both have low exposure and high engagement where we should probably think about what do we do for sort of all comers. Um, and a lot of this is probably simply giving proactive information. Um, so this, this is the sort of thing of like we need to be able to provide people with um, information about their costs, with information about when is care worth it. Um, this is things like not giving them unnecessary antibiotics like always using generics. I mean, these are the type of interventions we should do for everybody. But for folks who are highest risk, who are high exposure and have low engagement, um, we need to think about providing proactive resources. And just to recognize this is not, this is sort of like in a way a pyramid in that those at highest risk are really the tip of the iceberg. These are not all comers. Most people, we need interventions that go across the population um, that we can put in place. But the highest risk people, we need to start thinking about doing things differently. One idea we've just started to throw around as a, a way to think about this um, is whether we need a version of a local multidisciplinary tumor board for those at highest risk for healthcare associated financial issues. When you think about a tumor board, the way I think about it, it's local, it's multidisciplinary, it is highly personalized. They come together, they view the case, in total, they take into account all of the context, and they creatively work together to come up with an individualized plan. And I would say that this is required for those at highest risk. You know, would it look like something that we have a multidisciplinary team, financial uh, administrators, um, social workers, case managers, clinicians, who for those select few, um, we come together and we help determine how much does this cost? Is it worth it? And how are we going to ensure that you get it? Um, how can we create creatively and proactively manage this situation um, to help ensure affordability for patients? And I know that this is challenging, and I know that maybe this is aspirational, but I think the amount of progress that we have seen um, really helps me think that this is something we can do, um, that we can do better and that we can start pushing these next um, frontiers, and that over the next five years, 10 years, we will start to look back and say, we've got administrative homes for overuse in our hospitals. Um, we have redesigned some of the care pathways for folks and have started to put in place models like comprehensivists. Um, we now understand how much things cost, and we can help determine um, real value for folks. Um, and we now have interventions that address affordability for our patients on multiple levels and that think about the risks that patients have differently. And one way I think we can do this together is uh, many of you on this call hopefully are aware that the American Hospital Association has been launching this um, High Value Care Learning Collaborative because I think the only way we can do this is to learn from each other and to see what others are doing, see best practices, um, and start to adopt and, and start to um, experiment together. And so I think that this is going to be an incredibly informative um, 
group. I'm really excited to be in, involved and engaged in it. And I, I think that this has the potential to really help push us into that next frontier of learning together on how we're going to address high value care and affordability for our patients. Um, so with that, uh, I thank everybody for putting up with the technical difficulties. My slides were going in and out, and I guess the audio went in and out, but um, I think we made it through. Uh, and so thank you, and thank you, Lisa, for helping me and for having me. And uh, maybe we've got, it looks like we've got about 15 minutes for discussion. We do, and thank you. I appreciate very much the, uh, the extra plug for the collaborative. Chris is going to be one of our mentors in the, the collaborative, and uh, um, Applications are actually open until this Friday. They're up on our website. So um, if you'd like to apply, there is no cost for members to participate. And it's really a great uh, program, shaping up to be a great program, year-long collaborative. So thanks for the extra ad. Um, and Kristen has just put up the uh, link in the chat box. But let's get to some of these uh, questions. I'm going to uh, take the, I guess, moderator's prerogative and start with one. Um, that occurred to me as you were talking. Um, so for someone who's listening on the line who may not have any of these activities going on in their organization, where do you think they should start? Because you had a ton of really great ideas, but you know, it's almost overwhelming to think about. Yeah. Yeah, and I thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I do want to point out that um, Purposefully, I, I wanted to focus this talk. You know, a lot of times we talk about kind of the basics of value-based healthcare and where to start and all these things. And um, with this group, I, we were trying to push uh, forward on, on and sort of lay out a, a path of, in, in some ways, more advanced topics. But certainly, so starting out, I think a couple things. One is um, somewhat obvious, but really identifying a local champion. And, and the work that started at UCSF that um, I started to do was, by coming together with myself as a physician and our financial administrator within our division of hospital medicine. Um, and that, I think, was a really powerful uh, partnership that didn't come naturally, right? But, but if you can identify a dyad, um, a financial administrator and a physician who can come together and look at locally at your own practices, look at choosing wisely, look at your own data, and try to determine areas that, um, that you can address together. Uh, I think that was a really important way to get started. And also keeping the scope relatively small. So when we started, once again, you know, we weren't addressing these big redesign things that I'm talking about now, but rather just simply saying, hey, can we decrease nebulizer treatments um, on the hospital medicine service that, are, that seem to be unnecessary? Can we work with respiratory therapists and switch people over to inhalers sooner during their hospital stay and teach them how to use their inhalers? That, gets our foot in the door and gets us moving. And so I would say my advice is identify a physician and a financial administrator that can work together. Look at your own practices. You can use the Choosing Wisely list if you wish to, to generate some ideas about areas to start looking. Uh, but then just do something to show that you can make change within your group, um, that, that actually creating some sort of change is possible. And there are a number of resources, like I said, the, you know, plug for the curriculum once again, our Dell Med curriculum that's freely available that gives people the foundation about how to start thinking about and doing this work. Um, the High Value Practice Academic Alliance, because the other thing I would say is don't, um, when you identify those champions, even though you want to start small and stretch your scope, don't do this all on your own either. I mean, look around, there's a lot of folks in these learning collaboratives where people have started to come together and give examples of what they've done. Um, and so I think we should build off of that. Great. And I will absolutely uh, echo uh, Rhonda Anderson's point that uh, we, we definitely need to uh, involve the nursing leadership in this. And I know um, that's a strong part of the interprofessional work that you've done. Um, we had a couple of questions about um, sort of uh, moving this uh, forward. And I know one of the things that um, you and others have done is really try to make use of the electronic health record um, to coordinate some of these activities, which I realize is more of a challenge depending on the record you're working with and your organization. But can you talk a little bit about um, what you've done there? With the, uh, with the electronic health record? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, well, so 
I'll have to talk historically mostly because now <laughs> I'm in Austin and um, we are not on Epic. Um, we're on Compass, and I've we, we've had um, more political than technical challenges <laughs> um, getting things done there. But but certainly um, during our work at UCSF, um, we did a lot of work to get uh, to imp first. I first what we did was we focused on getting people to want to do the right thing. So I, I want to point out actually that. When we start to do this work, the first thing that always comes up, and I bet you this will be true for many of you, um, the first thing that always comes up is people say, like, well, let's just change the, the EHR, or we need a change the order set, or have a pop-up, or have a best practice alert, or, you know, everybody jumps to this intervention that has to do with the EHR. Um, and I think that we have a lot of lessons from our work um, that I'd be happy to go over some other time, but um, that showed that really, that's not going to be that effective most of the time. There's some interventions like nudges where people have done where they just like change the order of when meds pop up. I mean, you can nudge people in the right way. But what we focused on was actually getting people to want to do the right thing, so convincing them why switching from a NEB was, was preferable, getting them to work on that project together, getting them to make progress on that, and then implement into the EHR a system that makes it easier to do the right thing. Um, so, you know, we did a number of things like with that NEB project where we um, linked so that when people would order nebulizers, it would be linked to transition to inhaler and RT teaching and, and all of this. Um, for transfusions, we did it where it would take the person's median pre-transfusion hemoglobin um, and make sort of a, a, the default match um, what we wanted them to do. So if the hemoglobin was above eight, um, the default would say transfuse zero units, and it was very easy to override, but you didn't have to, like, get a best practice alert or something that you had to click out of. It was the, it made the right thing to do the easy thing to do. Um, and so I think that was really important. And, you know, um, working with uh, the folks at our hospital that could do the EHR work um, and working with them not just sending requests in, so, so, you know, actually getting people on our team who could do that sort of work, I think, was the key to us having some success at UCSF. But once again, I know that's um, easier said than done in a lot of places. Definitely. So how are you, um, one of the other questions is asking about uh, the uh, PDMs and drug prices and so forth. How have you addressed that in your work? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, I would say that, uh, so we, as in hospitals, and I'm going to focus on hospitals, I think it's an area that we don't pay enough attention to, um, which is medication prices at the at time of discharge, right? So there's the whole world of, like, us prescribing in the hospital. But then what happens is we prescribe medications to patients, we send them on their way, and oftentimes we don't have even as much insight as primary care physicians on um, whether that's the preferred medication, whether a patient can be able to afford it, and, um, and it, it's really complicated. So I would say concretely a couple things. I mean, I increasingly work with clinical pharmacists within our hospital, um, and anytime I'm sending someone out on a medication that I know could be an issue, like sending someone out on a NOAC oral anticoagulant or Lovenox or uh, prescribing Berlinta or something like that, um, consulting with them prior to sending out I think is really important. Um, we also have uh, on our, our um, curriculum, so module Six that's being released this month, or this week actually, is about high value prescribing. And it specifically talks about um, very pragmatic things that prescribers can, can do to decrease out-of-pocket costs for, for patients. Um, and so these are simple things, but like always ordering generic, um, ordering in bulk, thinking about therapeutic alternatives. Um, there's a number of things that can be done. And so that sort of breaks down and goes through the training. And then as far as, like, PBMs and high drug prices, which I think they're getting at, I think the only thing we can really do or the only thing I can do from where I sit is to advocate. So we can continue to point out, and I certainly do in any forum that I have, um, to point out that we need a more rational pricing system, that we need to not price gouge our patients. Um, but, you know, that I think is the role of, of us as professionals in advocacy. Um, but I'm not going to sit on my hands or, or – continue to point at, maybe not some of my hands, but just point at pharma and say, like, well, this is a terrible situation. I'm still committed to doing what's best for my patient. And if that means that in the interim I have to come up with some Band-Aids, some fixes, 
um, and make sure that I, you know, take it upon myself to, that I'm prescribing the, the best medication for that patient, um, that's what I'm going to do. And I will point out uh, one of the resources that's available on the Cost of Care website, which is available to all, are some great videos um, on talking to patients about uh, the cost, in particular one uh, on the cost of prescription. So that's if you right. want to take yep. a look at those, those are wonderful. Um, so where do you see um, your next steps in terms of the activities that, uh, that you're putting together? I'm just would love to know where, where you think you're going to take us uh, next on affordability. Yeah, so I, you know, this is the, I think, major emerging focus um, of especially our nonprofit group, Casa Care. Um, so Casa Care is a clinician-led group. Um, to the, to the point made earlier about nurses, our uh, director of operations is September Wanford, who is a, a practicing nurse and who always reminds us that you know, the number of nurses in this country dwarfs the numbers, <laughs> the numbers of physicians and, and the impact that they have. And so uh, we really are focusing on an interdisciplinary, interprofessional um, way of addressing this problem. Uh, but I'd say we're focusing on, one, how do, what tools do we need to have these appropriate cost conversations? Um, so how do we train people to have cost conversations with patients? How do we have the information we need to have informed cost conversations? And how do we work with health systems to come up with some of these interventions and solutions around affordability? Uh, and so I, it's still pretty early on. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like, just like I couldn't tell you five years ago what all the sort of um, – work that we ended up doing in hospital medicine to decrease uh, overuse would look like. Uh, but I think that that's the big thing is we've really focused on what are these cost conversations going to look like and what are the tools and the structures that we need in place um, to screen people for these issues, to be able to solve them, to create supportive structures so this isn't just telling doctors to take on one more thing and work harder. Um, that's really important to us. Uh, and so I, I think that's really where we're starting to focus. Great, and I see we've got another question here about um, looking at, you know, another uh, suggestion for um, as providers uh, asking payers to lower cost sharing based on using preferred methods, an example of uh, care in different settings, um, helping to direct work. That's certainly uh, work that uh, I know we are looking at and I'm sure others are. I did want to take just a moment to point out that one of the activities that AHA has been engaged in uh, over the last um, about six or seven months now has been something we refer to as the value initiative, which is really looking at some of these issues at the hospital system level. What are the areas where we can really help address um, the affordability of health care and what can hospitals do to contribute to that? So. There are a number of resources um, and information on our website, um, aha.org, I think it's slash value initiative. Um, so I just wanted to also take a moment to point that out as well. Um, yeah, and I think, um, you know, I, I recognize how this may sound being on your platform, but um, the reason I'm doing this and, and I'm excited about the, the uh, learning collaborative, all that is, uh, I have been quite impressed with the leadership of the American Hospital Association, what you all are doing. And, you know, I was able to meet um, Priya, who uh, is leading that value initiative, um, I guess it was a couple months back. And, uh, and she, along with you all, um, seemed to get it. And uh, it's really impressive. So I, I think, you know, focusing on um, us coming together and, as a group and, and recognizing that really this is going to be key to our success is that uh, we need to take on these tough, um, these tough questions, these tough problems, and the only way to do it is together. And to have an organizing body such as the AHA, I think, is really uh, going to be impor important. So, all right. Well, I don't think we have any more questions, and we're just about to the end of time. I did want to. Um, share with folks, there'll be uh, both a recording of this session and a copy of the slides with all the great links and resources that were highlighted um, on our website, which again is aha.org forward slash physicians. Uh, and you'll be able to access this um, there. And I uh, really appreciate, Chris, your time and appreciate everyone dialing in. 
and I uh, look forward to the next webinar, um, which the information for which is up on our website. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's presentation. You may now log off the webinar and disconnect your phone lines.